Today, with the singing of Psalm 126, uh, Psalm 126, you'll find it on the page 122 of the hymn book, 126, when Zion's bondage God turned back as men that dreamed were we, then filled with laughter was our mouth, our tongue with melody. And we'll stand together after the introduction and singing to the glory of God, Psalm 126. Let's stand together. Let's bow in a word of prayer together, please. Let's have every head bowed, every eye closed as we come before the Lord, before the throne. Eternal God and loving Heavenly Father, we do thank Thee and praise Thee for the opportunity that is ours to be in the house of our God afresh this Sabbath day. And we thank Thee for the health and the strength and Thy common grace which allows us to be here. We Acknowledge with James 1 that every good gift and every perfect gift cometh from above. And even the fact that once again we have been given oxygen to breathe, we have been given health and strength and journeying mercies to even gather in this place. And even the fact we have a local church that uh, the gospel is loved in, we, we thank thee for these things. We don't take them for granted. And we thank thee for the privilege that is ours to be in thy house again today. And, and we rejoice that thou alone art God. We thank thee there is none else beside thee. We come acknowledging who thou art today, Jehovah. We thank thee that thou Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, three in one and one in three, thou art the triune God. And when we think about all that thou hast done, for our redemption, we thank the Father for the fact that redemption was planned and set in motion before the foundation of the world. We thank Thee that the Son procured our redemption, died upon the tree, shed His own precious blood so that we could be liberated from our sin, so that our sin could be washed away, so that we could have redemption through His blood. We thank Thee for God the Holy Ghost, the one that applied redemption to our souls. When we look back, those of us that are saved, to that 
day and hour when we were redeemed and we acknowledged our sin and we felt the sinfulness of our sin and we knew that Christ alone was our only hope for redemption and salvation. We thank thee that it was God the Holy Ghost that applied the work of redemption, applied the blood to our souls. And we thank thee that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, all a part of our redemption. And we say thank you, Lord, for saving our souls. Thank you, Lord, for making us whole. Thank you, Lord, for giving to us thy great salvation, so rich and so free. And, O oh, Father, we do pray today, if there be one in this gathering that cannot say those words, cannot say, thank you, Lord, for saving my soul, O oh, God, we pray that by the time this meeting is finished, by the time in thy will they leave out of those church doors, that they will leave with a spiritual uh, skip and leap in their step, knowing they're saved, knowing they have tasted and seen that the Lord is good, and knowing they're saved and heaven-bound. O oh God, we pray, answer our cry today, and we freely acknowledge, acknowledging who thou art, and there is none else beside thee. But, O oh God, we, as we pray, we confess our sin as well. We confess the fact that our iniquities have been many, and we pray that thou forgive us our sin. We pray that thou forgive us our many transgressions. And we ask that thou be pleased to cleanse the hearts of thy people afresh today and prepare our hearts for worship. And we ask that everything that we say, think, and do, even in this time of worship, may be done in a holy manner and done unto the Lord. We pray that we wouldn't just go through the, the motions as a sort of popish ritual in a Protestant church, but we pray that, that this will be a, a true sense of a time of worship where every word we sing is sung heartily unto the Lord. That as we pray together, all of us pray and enter into the Holy of Holies together as the Word of God is opened and read. Oh God, help us to give due diligence to it, knowing that it is divine revelation to the soul. We pray that thou bless the preaching thereof and speak to our hearts and help us not just to be hearers of the word, but to be doers of the word also. But, oh God, as a people today in Monash Lane, we confess the sins of our nation as well. We believe that to be a biblical principle. We think of Daniel 9, when Daniel confessed the sin of his nation. And, Lord, today we intercede on behalf of our nation as well. Lord, we have a new prime minister. We pray, save his soul. We have a new government. Lord, save those in high office. Lord, we pray that thou would allow them to uh, rule in such a way that we as the people of God can live a quiet and peaceable life. And we do pray that thou be pleased to save our king, save the royal household, save those that have been thrust into power by obtaining seats in Westminster. We, we pray for our nation. Lord, at this moment we see many an ungodly ruler, many a ruler that that hates the things of Scripture. But Lord, we pray, turn us again. Revive the hearts of thy people. Visit our leaders and this people of this land with regeneration. We pray that many in these days will be born again of the Spirit of God as God comes down and visits this land. O oh, Father, answer our cry. Answer our cry for Jesus' sake and answer our cry for the exaltation of thy holy name so that many would come seeing the beauty and the majesty of the one that Scripture denotes as King of kings and Lord of lords. But, O oh, Father, we make our supplication also for those that can't be with us today. We ask for those that are shut in. We ask for those that are sick. O oh, God, we pray, touch them. And we pray that thou bless them with thy presence. Encourage those that are thy people that in ordinary circumstances, would be with us. We pray, encourage them. And Lord, we ask for those that aren't with us and could be with us. We pray that thou touch their hearts concerning that issue as well. But Lord, we do pray that thou watch over us now and help us in our worship. Help us in everything that is said and done to bring glory, honor, and praise unto the only one that is worthy, the altogether lovely Lord Jesus Christ. For it's in his name we ask these things, and in his name we pray. Amen. Hymn number 755, 
755. Almighty God, before thy throne, thy mourning people bend. Tis on thy pardoning grace alone our prostrate hopes depend. And how true that hymn is, and let's make it our prayer today, that our hopes depend on God alone, the Almighty. Hymn number 755 will stand after the introduction. Let's stand together. Turning in the Word of God together, please, to Proverbs chapter 14. Proverbs chapter 14. And if you're using the church Bible in the pew in front of you, you'll find the reading on page 679. Page 679. But Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 14. And we're going to begin our reading at the verse 23. And we're going to read down to the end of the chapter, to the end of the verse 35. In a few moments, we're going to be taking as our text this very famous verse that many, if not all of you, will know, the verse 34, looking at the subject, what our nation needs. What our nation needs. Proverbs 14 and the verse 23, the Word of God states, "...in all labor there is profit." But the talk of the lips tendeth only to penury. The crown of the wise is their riches, but the foolishness of fools is folly. A true witness delivereth souls, but a deceitful witness speaketh lies. In the fear of the Lord is strong confidence, and his children shall have a place of refuge. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life to depart from the snares of death. In the multitude of people is the king's honor. But in the want of people is the destruction of the prince. He that is slow to wrath is of great understanding, but he that is hasty of spirit exalteth folly. A sound heart is the life of the flesh, but envy the rottenness of the bones. He that oppresseth the poor reproacheth his maker, but he that honoureth him hath mercy on the poor. The wicked is driven away in his wickedness, But the righteous hath hope in his death. Wisdom resteth in the heart of him that hath understanding. But that which is in the midst of fools is made known. Righteousness exalteth a nation. But sin is a reproach to any people. The king's favor is toward a wise servant. But his wrath is against him that causeth shame. We trust the Lord who bless the public reading of his holy and precious word to each of our hearts today. 
Now at this point in the service, let me welcome each one to the house of the Lord today. It's good to see you, and we especially welcome those visiting with us as well, and we trust the Lord will especially bless your heart as you gather with us for worship in Monash Lane for this hour. Please remember the gospel service tonight at 7 p.m., and that's preceded by a half-hour prayer beginning at 6.30 in the church hall. And tonight we're looking at that phrase in Scripture, Lord, save us, we perish. Lord, save us, we perish. But if I could just give notice to the gospel boss team, if you could wait behind after the evening service, that would be greatly appreciated. Then for the week ahead of us on Tuesday, the gospel boss meeting for the boys and girls at 7 p.m. And then on Wednesday, our prayer meeting and Bible study at 8 p.m. God willing, this coming Wednesday, the Reverend David Priestley will be the preacher at our Bible study. Then the services next Lord's Day, the morning worship at 12 noon, the evening gospel service at 7 p.m. Please remember both of those services preceded by our half-hour prayer and the Sabbath school and Bible class have now finished for the summer months. But please, please remember not just the ordinary times of worship, but the prayer times as well. At 11.30, we need people to pray. At 6.30, we need people to pray. Please do come for those times of prayer. And the preacher next Lord's Day, the Reverend Derek Irwin. I will be away on holidays from tomorrow, the 8th of July, for two weeks through to Monday, the 22nd of July. So in the case of any emergencies, please do speak to an elder and they'll put you in contact with the minister that is covering me for the next two weeks. Please remember today is our retiring missionary offering. And let me thank you for the very generous maintenance fund offering that came in last Lord's Day. That amounted to £1,345. And we do sincerely thank you in the Saviour's name. Let me also thank all those that worked so hard in making the five-day club in Drumlin Grange the great success that it was. We had a tremendous interest from the boys and girls in our locality. There's 24 different children in total and about 16 to 18 at each meeting, which we were greatly encouraged by and thank the Lord for. And I'd like to thank all those that uh, participated in some way or another. There were those that donated uh, sweets and prizes and different things like that. And, and the children really did enjoy those things. And we want to thank those that did that and also those that came and sat among the children. We couldn't have the meetings without those workers, and also the men that brought the bus down day after day in case the rain was to come on. But the Lord kept the rain off. We had a wonderful week, and the Lord was there. And I trust you'll remember it in prayer. Even though the week may have finished now, please pray that the gospel and the seed that was sown would even grow in many of the hearts of those boys and girls. Let me also thank all those that helped out with the barbecue yesterday. We had a wonderful time of fellowship, and it was a wonderful blessing to be here yesterday as well. So I want to thank all those that, that did something in that way to make that the success that it was as well. But please do continue to pray for those that are sick in the church family. Remember those that are shut in at this time. And continue to remember those that maybe have been bereaved of late. Please, let's try and encourage one another in the Lord and, and ring one another up and visit them and, and just encourage them. We're a church family. Let's remember that. But all these announcements are subject to the will and mind of the Lord. But we'll have our offering hymn now, please. Hymn number uh, 752. 752 in the national section of the hymn book again. O oh God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come, our shelter from the stormy blast, and our eternal home. 752, keeping our seats while our tithes and offerings are collected for the work of God in this place.
stand as we sing verses 5 and 6. Verse 5. Turning in the Word of God together, please, to Proverbs chapter 14. Proverbs chapter 14 and the verse 34 is our text, a well-known text, I'd imagine, to the Lord's people. And we're looking at the title, What Our Nation Needs. What Our Nation Needs. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 34. <clears throat> the Word of God states, Righteousness exalteth a nation but sin is a reproach to any people. Righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. With our Bibles open before God, let's bow in a word of prayer together, please. Let's have every head bowed in the Master's presence. Eternal God and loving Heavenly Father, we thank Thee and we praise Thee for all that we have been able to sing by way of singing Thy praises today. We do acknowledge that God has been our help in ages past. We know as a nation we have known great blessings from Thee. As a nation we have known great deliverances from Thee. And how poorly we have returned the favor when we think of our sin and our iniquity and our lawlessness and our immorality flying in the, the face of God with rebellious acts time and time again in response to thy mercy. Oh God, forgive our land, we pray. Forgive us, even as the church. We know that many of the symptoms in the land has taken place because of compromise in the church, because of apostate Christianity. Lord, we just pray that thou turn us again. Turn us again unto thyself. And we pray that even today, as the people of God, we would have a right view as to what our nation needs and that we will be those that pray concerning it. But Lord, bless us now, for we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. What our nation needs. The nation has spoken, hasn't it? On Thursday past, the United Kingdom went to the ballot box afresh, and we voted. And let me just say this, I hope you did vote. Uh, Romans 13 tells us that Christians are to be involved in the life of the nation. Uh, that's a very important principle. Uh, Christians are to be involved in the life of the nation. Anyhow, as a nation, the nation has spoken. And after 14 years of a conservative government, and I'll say this without saying too much, there has been very little conservation when you think of what the conservative uh, name means very little uh, Bible Christianity or principles or morality has been conserved in the last 14 years. Really, they're misnamed as the Conservative Party. But anyway, by now an overwhelming majority, there is a Labour government with over 400 seats in Westminster. And I'll be honest with you, those sort of things used to bother me. I used to be one of those that sat up all night watching the election coverage and all the rest of it, but I'll be honest with you, to a large extent, it doesn't bother me anymore. And I'll tell you why. Because they're all the same. <laughs> Sadly, they're all as bad as one another. And it makes very little difference as to who is leading the nation at all nowadays. And I was thinking it's amazing, really, how overnight... Overnight, everything changed, really, didn't it? Parliament changed radically. The government changed. Uh, 10 Downing Street changed. And a new prime minister. 
And yet you and I will watch on and very little will change in the life of the nation at all, relatively speaking. Nothing changes at all because we still carry on in sin, don't we? As a nation, we still tempt our God with our many iniquities. Still, time and time again, we are lawless when it comes to the things of God. And still, as a nation, we deserve God's wrath upon us. And the very fact that God's wrath has not come in a full measure is because of the mercy of the Lord. And you say, what does our nation need? And I'm preaching this sermon because there are still Christians, even though I say it is vitally important, I believe we are involved in the life of the nation. Our nation does not need a new prime minister. Our nation does not need a new government or a new parliament or new politicians. What does our nation need? Our nation needs Christ. That's what our nation needs. Our nation needs the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the only thing that will change our nation. That is the only thing that will radically transform this land of ours. Our nation needs Christ. And Proverbs 14, the verse 34, tells you that. It says, Righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. And it does not matter what color of political party are in government. Sin, sin is a reproach to any people. So in looking at this verse, I want you to do three things with me. Number one, the exaltation of a nation. Number two, the reproach of a nation. And then thirdly, the urgent need of the nation. So number one, the exaltation of a nation. Now, we find in the verse 34, it's very clear, and Solomon is writing in days when actually he knew what it was in the world's eyes to have an exalted Israel, but it says, righteousness exalteth a nation. Now, there's such a thing as a nation being exalted. What does it mean, exalted as a nation, in the verse 34? What does that word exalted mean? Does it mean that the nation becomes powerful? Is that what it means? When you think of our own history in this land, you think of uh, the British Empire at its height in, what, 1919, 1920 or thereabouts, uh, 26.3% of the world's uh, land mass was under British rule. When you think about that, that is quite extraordinary, really. Uh, 13.7 million square miles were under British authority, uh, apparently 412 million people under the reign of the British monarch. It was said that the British Empire was the empire on which the sun never sets. Now, exalted, is that what we term as a nation being exalted? Well, it might be in the world's eyes. That's maybe what it means for a nation to be exalted. It might be... Uh, financial uh, success as a nation to be exalted. I want to tell you that that type of exaltation, it comes and goes, because even though the British Empire may have been at its height in the 1920s, by the 1960s, all that was gone, wasn't it? All that was finished to a large extent. The world's eyes, that type of exaltation comes and goes. So what is the exaltation? Of the verse 34. What is a lasting exaltation that a nation can and must strive for? Well, I would argue that real exaltation for a nation is when God thinks highly of that nation. That's different altogether, isn't it? Real exaltation is when God thinks highly of that particular nation and thinks highly of them because of their righteousness thinks highly of them because of their holiness. You think of Israel and the nation of Israel. When Israel were a godly nation, when it had a king, for instance, that did right in the eyes of the Lord, Israel at best was still a very relatively small and tiny nation, yet they were exalted. Why? Because God thought highly of them. That's real exaltation. 
Come with me to Deuteronomy 26. Deuteronomy 26 and the verses 18 and 19. And what we read here, of course, is in reference to the children of Israel and the nation of Israel, yet how the same principle can be applied to our own nation and every nation across the globe if it were to turn unto the Lord. For it's righteousness that exalteth a nation. And it says in Deuteronomy 26, look at the verses 18 and 19. It says, and wonderful words these are, and these are things that I, I hope and pray that our own nation would, would cling on to promises in the word of God. It says in Deuteronomy 26 verse 18, And the Lord hath avouched thee this day to be his peculiar people, as he hath promised thee and that thou shouldest keep all his commandments, and to make thee high above all nations which he hath made, in praise and in name and in honor, that thou mayest be an holy people unto the Lord thy God, as he hath spoken. Isn't it interesting there? We find a principle, of course this is speaking about Israel, but a principle for our own land. If our own land keeps all his commandments, we find there's a principle. What is it? Verse 19. And to make thee high above all nations which he hath made, in praise and in name and in honor, that thou mayest be in holy people unto the Lord thy God. It's righteousness, holiness. That's what exalts a nation. Come with me to Romans 13. I've already mentioned it today, but come with me to Romans 13. What does it mean then to have righteousness in the nation? Well, I believe it's not just a matter of its leaders, but that's part of it. We'll come to that now. But, but also the generally, the average person, the grassroots individual are holy unto the Lord, keeping his commandments. You know, there were many times in history where maybe the leaders were ungodly, yet there were many people that were saved and endeavoring to strive for the Lord. You think of Scotland in John Knox's day. The, the, the Protestant Reformation had gotten a hold in Scotland. Many were turned unto Christ. Many were following the, the paths of the straight and narrow way, and yet the leadership were ungodly. That has happened before. Other times there have been leadership that is godly in a nation that wants to go wayward. You saw that maybe even in the times of Cromwell and the Puritans, where the people wanted someone else to lead. But nonetheless, holy leaders are a part of it. Look at Romans 13 and look at the verses 3 and 4. And this is a challenge for every leader, every politician, every king, every prime minister or president. It says, this is the duty given unto them from Almighty God. Romans 13 verse 3. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is a minister of God to thee for good. You think about that. That's what our prime minister is to be doing. He is meant to be a servant or a minister of God to thee for good. Oh, how we've come a long way from that. What does it say at the start of the verse 3? For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. What is the God-ordained plan that every secular leader and magistrate in the land is to follow? Every king, every president, every prime minister, every government. What is the pattern in Romans 13? Rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. How sad it is that and most of our generations sitting in this church, we've known it the other way around, haven't we? We've known it where our leaders have been a terror to good works and actually promoters of evil deeds, haven't we? We lived in a day and still live in a day where governments legislate, legislate for wickedness. They legislate for that which is unseemly in the sight of God. And they are being a terror to the good. We find this push for conversion therapy. That is another way, a politer term maybe, of trying to make Christianity and gospel preaching illegal. That's as simple as it comes. You look at the Christian Institute literature that they send out just to preach the gospel and tell someone they should repent of their sin. Is classified as conversion therapy, and successive governments are trying to push that and make that illegal so that we cannot even preach the gospel in our own churches anymore. That's what's going on. 
But the ruler in a godly nation, rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. I want to tell you this. Every ruler, every prime minister, every president, every king will stand before God one day and give an account of how they have ruled with the power God gave them to, uh, gave them. But, but look at Mark chapter uh, 16 with me, please. Mark chapter 16. So you see, right, real exaltation is when God thinks well of a nation, and a nation is to keep all his commandments, be holy unto the Lord, then it will know something of exaltation. We to have holy leaders, those that are a terror to evil and not to good works. Well, how is the nation to hear the gospel, maybe you wonder? Well, that's where you and I come in, and that's where I believe that our nation and many nations around the globe have, have fallen short because the church has failed to a large extent. Look what it says in, in Mark 16, verse 15. And he said, the Lord Jesus said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Now you think of it even in our own land and nation. We still in this nation have an established church, an established so-called Protestant church. We still have in our houses of parliament, in the House of Lords, a whole number of bishops that are meant to be the moral compass of the nation, leading the nation in godliness. You ask, where has the nation gone wrong? I would argue it's apostate Christianity. That's where the nation has gone wrong. Because the issue came up, whatever issue it was, and Christians refused to speak. And then others that came in, wolf in sheep's clothing, came in, and they weren't Christians at all. And apostate Christianity flourished. And yes, they may hold the name that they're Christian. They may hold the name that they're a minister, an elder, a bishop, or an archbishop, or whatever. But they're not saved people. And the nation, especially their own nation, has lost its moral compass in that sense because the church has lost its way and they're not preaching the gospel to every creature any longer. You say, why in the free church over the years have we been so hard on the apostasy? Because it is, it, it, much of it is the apostasy's fault. That's why the problem began in the pulpit and the pulpit infected the pew and the pew infected society and largely it was the fact that the word of God was not preached. And that's where the demise of our nation began. Well, then come with me to Psalm 2. Psalm 2. I want you to note that Psalm 2 is a prophetic psalm. Psalm 2 is talking about future days, future times. Nonetheless, there's a principle here for all leaders, for all kings, for all of society, that we are to be those that endeavor to, to please the Lord. And kings are expected to obey. They're noted here in Psalm 2. But everyone is expected to obey the Lord Jesus Christ. And it says in Psalm 2, in the verse 10 through to 12, it says, Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings. Be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry, and ye perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. That's the secret for a nation. That's the secret right there. That's how a nation is exalted. Righteousness. Righteousness exalteth a nation. That's why Psalm 2 says, Be wise now therefore, O ye kings, and kiss the Son. Serve the Lord. That's the, that's the secret. But then I want you to note not only the exaltation of a nation... But I want you to note, secondly, the reproach of a nation. The reproach of a nation. Look what we read back in Proverbs 14 in the verse 34. It says, Righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Sin is a reproach to any people. Now, when people reject God, what happens? Well, well we find sin reigns. When leaders in the nation, when leaders in the church reject God. Nations sin. We've already noted that. I just want to make something perfectly clear that sin deserves the wrath of God. And if you die in your sin, well, you'll face the wrath of God for all eternity. And I'll also say this, you can be saved from your sin today if only you repent and believe the gospel and put your trust for redemption in Jesus Christ alone. But ultimately, when we reject God, sin 
reigns. Now you think even of our new prime minister. And this is why I say I have absolutely no hope whatsoever in this new government because our new prime minister, Keir Starmer, in March 2022, in multiple interviews, didn't know the difference between a man and a woman. That's our new prime minister, folks. I'm sure you'll find many, many more sinful and iniquitous blunders to come as well. That's the type of character, legislating, ruling in our nation, bringing in laws for the next five years, doesn't even know the difference between a man and a woman. Listen, the most basic child could tell you the, the, the difference, and it's a tragedy. We live in a nation that is pro-everything that God is against and anti-everything God is for. We live in a nation that is pro-sodomy. We live in a nation that is pro-murder of the unborn. We are pro in this land and nation everything that is sinful and iniquitous and liberal, and we are for, uh, 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 and rather we are anti-God, anti-Bible, anti scripture anti-God's law. That is the way our nation is nowadays. And we as the people of God in Monastery, you say, what can I do? I say, you can intercede for the nation. You can pray for the nation. It is God that holds the king's heart in his hand and, and can turn it with us whoever he will. Prayer does change things, friend, but at this moment we live in a wicked nation. Come with me to Proverbs 29, just over a few pages. Proverbs 29. And look at the verse 16. And when I read these words, I, I, I think just constantly this phrase, this is our day and generation. This is my day and generation. This is the day and generation that I am living in, in 2024. And it says in Proverbs 29, look at the verse 16, when the wicked are multiplied, transgression increaseth. But look at this phrase, isn't this lovely? But the righteous shall see their fall. But the righteous shall see their fall. There's coming a day, by the way, that the Lord will return, the judgment will happen, that ultimately the, the, the sheep and the goats will be divided. And however much the wicked are multiplied today, I want to say at some point, the righteous will see their fall. So don't be despondent, Christian. The righteous will see their fall. But also in this same chapter, uh, look at the verse 2. It says, when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when the wicked beareth rule, the people mourn. This is our day and generation. And when we come back to Proverbs 14 and the verse 34, and it says, righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. What is the word reproach? What does that mean? It means it's a shame upon them a shame upon them, or, or even a, a disgrace upon them, a, a disdain is there upon the land. Shame abides upon our land and nation because of its sin. Sin is a shame to any people. Sin is a disgrace to any people. It is a reproach to any people. And this is how we are, that in the sight of God, we are to be ashamed. We are to be ashamed as we stand disgraced in the sight of our God. We often forget who our God is. Our God is holy. 1 Peter tells us that. I'm sure you know it. 1 Peter 1 verse 16, it says, Be ye holy, for I am holy. 1 Samuel 2 verse 2 says, There is none holy as the Lord. God is the perfect standard of holiness. And you think how far we fall short in our sin and our wickedness and our immorality and our many iniquities. Listen to me, my friend. We should be ashamed, ashamed of our nation. Look what we read in Daniel chapter 9. I want you all to turn there. Daniel, Daniel chapter 9, please. Because Daniel chapter 9 is, is a very interesting chapter. And Daniel, I believe, gives us a pattern for what we are to do as Christians in our wicked land. Daniel prays. Daniel prays. And what a prayer it is. I hope you'll look at it. You'll study it. You'll take note of the phrases he uses. And he intercedes for his nation. That's what he does. He knows the promises of God. He knows the claims of Scripture. He knows what Jeremiah preached. And he, 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 he feels within his own power there's very little he can do, but he prays. Look at Daniel chapter 9 and look at the verse 3. Uh, verse 3, and we'll read a few verses, right through to verse 11. And note the phrases that he uses here. And you could pray the same over our nation. 
Look at it. Every eye on it. Daniel 9, verse 3. And I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplications, note it, with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. This is intense prayer now. This is prayer where he's meaning to do business with God. He's fasting with sackcloth and ashes in mourning. And look what it says in the verse 4. And I prayed unto the Lord God, uh, Lord my God and made, look at it, my confession and said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, keeping covenant and mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commandments. Now, note the words here. I've, I've highlighted them in my Bible. Note what he says, verse 5. We have sinned. Isn't that interesting? Do you not find that interesting? I think it's fascinating. He doesn't say just our nation has sinned. He doesn't say the people have sinned. He doesn't say our leaders have sinned. But see how he identifies with the sin of the nation and he confesses the sin of the nation even as his own. Daniel, Daniel wasn't part of the sin of the nation. Daniel was a teenager when Israel and Judah had sinned and were taken away into Babylon. Daniel was holy unto the Lord. You read that in the book of Daniel. But he identified himself with his nation's sin and he confessed it before the Lord. And he said, we have sinned. Isn't that interesting? Look at the verse 5. We have sinned and committed iniquity and have done wickedly and have rebelled even by departing from thy precepts and from thy judgments. Neither have, note it again, we hearkened unto thy servants, the prophets, which spake in thy name to our kings and our princes and our fathers and to all the people of the land. O Lord, righteousness belongeth unto thee. I've already noted, haven't we, if you just stop there a moment, we've noted in Proverbs 14, the secret to an exalted nation. Righteousness exalteth a nation. We'll look more at that in a little moment. But, O oh Lord, righteousness belongeth unto thee. Verse 7. But, but unto us, what can we say in our prayer? Unto us confusion of faces. Oh, there's not much more confusion than a prime minister that doesn't know the difference between a boy and a girl, maybe. Confusion of faces. It says in the verse 7, As at this day to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to all Israel that are near and that are far off through all the countries, whither thou hast driven them because of their trespass, that they have trespassed against us. And look at this now. Look at the same words he uses. O Lord, to us, Daniel identifies with the sin of the land. O Lord, to us belongeth confusion of face. To our kings, to our princes, to our fathers, because we have sinned against thee. To the Lord our God belongeth mercies and forgivenesses, though we have rebelled against him. Neither have we obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his ways which he set before us by his servants the prophet. Yea, all Israel, and we can say, yea, all the United Kingdom, have transgressed thy law, even by departing, that they might not obey thy voice. Therefore the curse is poured upon us and the oath that is written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, because we have sinned against him. Everyone looking this way a moment, how often, and I'm just as guilty as anybody else, but how often have we lamented and moaned about the state of the nation, but we have never prayed like this for our nation? We have never interceded like Daniel interceded for his nation. You say, what can I do concerning the wickedness in my land in Monash Lane? You can pray and God will hear your cry. And you think if every child of God in this meeting prayed the earnest prayer that Daniel prayed, you think what could be done as work is done at the mercy seat? as we petition the throne of heaven and we do business with our God. We need to get into the place of prayer. For as things stand, well, Isaiah chapter 1 and the verse 4 is the sign and signal and motto of our nation, our sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger. They are gone away backward. That's the state of our nation today. But I want you to note not only the exaltation of a nation and secondly, the reproach of a nation, but thirdly, the urgent need of the nation. 
the urgent need, therefore, of the nation. I'd imagine everyone here in this meeting will agree that there is a need in this nation, the urgent need of the nation. Well, Proverbs 14, verse 34, righteousness, righteousness exalteth a nation. Righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Righteousness, godly leadership in the nation, Christians and churches that know what it is to be holy. We need that radical transformation that only the Lord can give. Our nation needs to turn unto God if it is ever going to be blessed. If it is ever going to know the blessing of the Lord, we must turn to Him in righteousness and holiness, confessing our sin before Him. You know, in our land and nation, you you find all sorts of uh, politicians and parties and manifestos, and, and they all will recognize one thing. There is a problem in the nation there are problems that need to be addressed, and they'll talk about financial issues and social issues. And Listen, I agree with them. I agree. There's financial problems, and there's social issues, and there's moral issues, but it all comes down to one issue, the spiritual issue, the fact that sin is reigning in the nation. That's the issue. That's the problem. They don't see it as that. They don't see the solution in righteousness. But that's the problem. That's what it comes down to. Sin or righteousness. Sin or righteousness. Come with me to 2 Chronicles chapter 7, please. I want you all to turn there. 2 Chronicles 7 and the verse 14 is a familiar portion to God's people. But what do we need in our land? I would argue before anything is to be done in the political realm or the national realm, something needs to happen in the spiritual realm in the church of Jesus Christ and in Christendom in the nation. And it needs revival. The church needs revival. That's where it will begin. Listen, uh, revival or, or wonderful things, righteousness happening in the nation will not be because a king or a prime minister or a parliamentarian or whatever finds the Lord Jesus Christ. It begins in the church, friend. It begins in the church. Revival is needed in the church of Jesus Christ. And it says in 2 Chronicles 7 and the verse 14, if my people, those three words are the key words to this verse, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves, That's not easy done, but that's what's needed. Humble themselves and pray. Oh, are we praying the prayer of Daniel 9? I don't think we are as yet. I don't think our hearts are stirred enough or touched enough to pray and lament over our nation as yet. It says, and seek my face. The idea is that the Lord's face has been distant for a time. We need to re-seek it and find it and turn from their wicked ways. Isn't that a challenge in the church? If my people turn from their wicked ways. Wickedness in the church. Fancy that. But yes, that's what it's saying. Then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. You know, we often hear prayer for the nation, and people saying, Lord, revive the nation. I want to make it clear. You have in America these revival meetings, people call it. And when they say they're having revival meetings, all they're saying is they're having a gospel mission. Listen, revival does not come to the unregenerate. Revival does not come to the unconverted. Revival is something that comes to the church. It is revival, something that was alive and is seemingly slumped into a dead and apathetic condition, and it needs to be made re-alive, revival. Revival. revival doesn't come to the unregenerate. Revival comes to the church. And that's what we need. We need revival in the church. We need revival among the people of God. First Peter chapter 4 and the verse 17 leaves us with a very solemn note. I'll read it to you. It says in 1 Peter 4 and the verse 17 these words, For the time has come, the judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? You think of that judgment coming first to the house of God. That's a solemn thought, isn't it? Revival needs to come to the church. The nation will know a blessing if the church is revived. Then what does the nation need? If we're going to pray intelligently for our land before the throne of grace, we can pray for revival in the church 
And what else? Regeneration in the nation. That's what our nation needs. Our nation needs Christ. Our nation needs to be saved. Our nation need to be a people that have been lawless and rebellious and anti-God and anti-Scripture and anti-holiness and anti-righteousness. And we need the Lord, the Holy Spirit of God to visit them and remove the heart of stone and replace it with a heart of flesh. And salvation needs to visit the lives of many in our district. That's what they need. Revival is for the church. Regeneration is for the unconverted. And that's what they need. Come with me to Isaiah 66. Isaiah 66 in the verse 8. And I want you all to see this. I think the Reverend Macmillan uh, highlighted this in, in one of his messages, actually. But we find in Isaiah chapter 66 in the verse 8, actually a reference to the land of Israel and the Jewish people. And we find a wonderful phrase referring to the fact that when the Lord comes again, the Jewish people or the nation of Israel, as it then remains, will be saved, will be born again. Regeneration will visit as they see the Lord. So it's a future time that Isaiah 66 and the verse 8 is speaking of. But look at the phrase here. Who hath heard such a thing? Who hath seen such things? Shall the earth be made to bring forth in one day? Or look at it. Or shall the nation be born at once? For as soon as Zion travailed, she brought forth her children. Isn't it interesting? A nation being born in a day. I believe that will happen. I believe that will happen with future Israel, that the Jewish people, upon seeing the Lord break through the clouds, they will recognize him as Messiah, and they will look with a saving look, and they will be those that repent of their sin and believe the gospel, and that's a wonderful theme. But I want to leave it with this, this thought. Even though this is applying to Israel and Israel of the future, if God can save a nation in a day, you think what God could do for our own land and nation. And revival power. He could visit this land with regeneration. I don't believe this nation will be born in a day. I don't believe the entirety of this nation will be born again. But you just think what God could do if all of the people of God did business with God for the souls of our land. You know, in Romans 10 and the verse 1, Paul was a man that prayed for his nation. It says in Romans 10, verse 1, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. That prayer will be answered one day. But I ask, if I were to ask you seriously, intimately, and you give me an honest answer, can you say, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for my land and nation? Can you honestly say, it's my heart's desire, it's my prayer for my nation that they would be saved? I don't think we've got to that point yet. I don't think even as the church we are aware of what we can do. You think what God can do even in a small measure in the United Kingdom if we did business before Him and cried, Lord, forgive us our sin and save us. Revive thy church and bring regeneration to thy people. God did do it once, you know. You think in 1859... In 1859, in this little province of Ulster, over 100,000 people were converted to Christ. That's what God can do, friend. That's what God can do. In the Great Awakening, under Whitfield and the Wesleys and the, the preachers of that ilk, it was said in the United Kingdom at that time, 1.25 million people turned to Christ in saving faith. You think of what God can do. If only the people of God in Monash Lane were to pray for our land and nation and petition for revival in the church and were to petition for regeneration in the land, you think of what God could do. So how can it be done? How can it be done? Is it through elections? Is it through politicians? Is it through a particular party? Is it through whatever happened last lesson, friend? It's through Christ. Christ. That's the key. Righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Therefore, what we can do, we can follow the pattern of Daniel 9. Plead for the nation. Intercede for the nation. And then go out and go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Every single Christian here has a part to play. 
I fear for too long the church of Jesus Christ has not been fulfilling the role of salt and light that we should be. I wonder today will we resolve that we can have an influence in prayer, in practicality, and doing a work for God in our nation. Maybe there's one here and you say, well, it's okay, you've spoken about the nation today, you've spoken about the things that a nation needs, you've spoken about the wickedness of the nation, but maybe you know in your own heart you're still not saved. And you know in your own heart that sin still reigns. You know in your own heart if you were to die right now, you would end up in a lost sinner's hell. Well, friend, I plead with you, come to Christ and be in time. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. And then, when you become a child of God, you can do a work for God. For righteousness exalteth a nation. But sin is a reproach to any people. We trust the Lord to bless his word to each of our hearts for his own namesake. Hymn number 756. Hymn number 756. Great King of nations, hear our prayer while at thy feet we fall and humbly with united cry to thee for mercy call. The guilt is ours, but grace is thine. O turn us not away, but hear us from thy lofty throne and help us when we pray. 756, we'll stand together as we sing. Let's stand together. Father, we thank Thee and praise Thee for the opportunity to be in the house of God today, but we pray that Thou give the people of God a resolve, a wonderful resolve, to pray, to preach, to be holy unto the Lord, and turn our nation back unto Thee, we plead. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.